We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Jaime Carrasco, Portfolio Manager at Canaccord. How are you today, Jaime? I'm well. Thanks for having me back. You know, and every time you have me, it's always an interesting times. Well, I think that's that's quite the understatement is that we live in interesting times and we always have a lot to talk about. So uh, where would where would you like to start today? Usually um, we, we kind of touch on something in particular. Uh, we could start at the Evergrande situation, um, you know, looking uh, forward to the week ahead with the Fed meeting on Wednesday. Um, so what's on your mind today, honey? Well, I think, first of all, we should we should look at it from a big picture um, and then come down to 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 the ground. And I think on a big picture, I think uh, people have to concentrate on the positives. Um, you know, if you, we start concentrating on the negatives, we don't get anything done on the positive. One thing that I see is that as a, as a human uh, species, we are completely redefining or rethinking about our worldview. You know, the fact that we are interconnected, the fact that whatever's happening in Australia today and what's happening in Canada, what's happening in the U.S., it's, 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 it's affecting us, what's happening in the Middle East. And that is important because to some extent, as human beings, we, ha- we are becoming aware of each other. And I think that'll be very positive as we go through the monetary transition that I keep talking about that I think we have begun and we began a long time ago. You know, um, on a on a quick note to that one, it's it's funny. I love the discussion of the of the debt ceiling, right? That oh, we're going to raise the debt ceiling without people realizing that that ceiling broke fifty years ago. It was fifty years ago that Nixon was forced to to create the fiat currency system that we're in, in order to allow for the growth of debts that we have today. Right. And that is the problem, as I keep pointing out. Uh, There was a report I posted on my LinkedIn page about how we have reached 300 billion in debt. Now, keep in mind that that's only debt. Forget about the credit derivative swaps and everything else that the bankers have written on top of that debt to protect themselves, which is really to create fees on the on that. What? Two and a half quadrillion. So twenty five hundred trillion dollars worth of bets that they were making fees on. Let's put that aside. Let's talk about the 300 billion. Well, when you think about it in the context of the fact that equity values around the world is about 120 billion, well, that's like a rich guy saying, hey, I live in a $5 million or a $100 million house, but I have 300 million in debt. Well, net, we are broke because of the fiat system that we've created. And that has consequences and that has the setup for a beautiful power shift that I think we're about to go through. Mm-hmm. So is that 300 billion, Jaime, is that worldwide, as you're saying? That was worldwide government. Okay, so and, 300 and, tri- trillion then, right? Sorry, 300 trillion. Okay. You're right. All right. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> we got that extra zero. You're right. Cu- yeah, a couple, That's couple a really zeros matter. missing. If it's 300 billion versus 100 billion, 300 trillion versus 300 trillion. The point being is that we are on a debt to equity ratio that it's crazy. And that has consequences because a lot of that 300 trillion, that debt doesn't disappear. And this has been my point all along. A lot of that debt is sitting in pension funds. People are depending on the cash flow of that debt. So, so that th- those those uh, liabilities that people will depend on are there, but then the equity behind it isn't there, and that's a disconnect, and that is the problem in the system today, that we have all of this debt lurking around, which is why I keep going back to gold as the ultimate hedge, which it has been for four thousand years. So, interestingly enough. Uh... And and kind of coincidentally, this this Evergrande situation in China that's developing, and I think you were pointing out on your your Twitter page that we'll find out more about it this week. How that's going to affect, let's say, the banking system in China. It their liabilities on their balance sheet is about three hundred billion dollars, and Correct. that's many times the size of Lehman Brothers. So, how could that you know really start to affect and and push? push the first domino over um, in, a, in a situation like that? 
Well, the dominoes are exactly the same as they were during the Lehman Brothers situation. The only thing that they're bigger, because if we look at the at the shadow banking system, which uh, I know DiMartino, uh, Daniela DiMartino Booth has pointed out, has grown exponentially since 2008. So as I keep arguing, in 2008, we just kicked the can down the road and we created more debt. Now, what's interesting that nobody talks about is the fact that in 2008, we were able to kick the can down the road because China funded all of this liquidity into the system. But in exchange for that, they started taking our gold at very cheap prices. There was another piece that I put this week, how, how China is sitting all kinds of gold. And we're looking at 20,000 tons of gold. Now, we know that because they smelted, they, they re-smelted all the gold since we work in an imperial system. All the gold that was transferred over to China was re-smelted into metric into kilo bars because they work on a metric system, and then they shipped it into the Shanghai exchange. Now, it's important to note that that gold's not sitting within the Chinese central bank. So one of the miscommunications that's always said, oh, the Chinese are sitting on 2,000 tons of gold. No, they're not. China is sitting on 20,000 tons plus the 2,000, plus the fact that they're the biggest producer in the world, subsidizing it at $3,000 an ounce. That should give you some alarms. Now, why is all this important? If I was Xi and if I was um, a follower of Sun Tzu and Confucius, what would I be doing? I would have said to the Chinese, well, let's buy all that gold. You, can, you guys can have it because we know there will be another economic crisis coming down the line. Evergrande, could it be? I think it, it might be. One is coming. Now, what would I do next? I would do exactly what history taught me to do, which is do what Roosevelt did. Say to the Chinese, great, yes, you've lost all this money on the on those cities that we've funded, that you put down payment, but we can't give you because the company, the construction company is broke. But tell you what, those 20,000 tons of gold, I'm going to buy it from you, I'd call it $3,000 an ounce to recapitalize you. Chinese are going to be very happy and they're going to sell it. Well, then... May 1, 1933, Roosevelt pops back the, the, the reverse, and then he says, okay, from this point forward, we will create a brand new yuan backed by gold, which you won't be able to buy, but your gold is, the yuan is going to be convertible to gold at $5,000. Guess what? We've just recreated the monetary shift, just as Roosevelt did in 1933. Why do people not think that China wouldn't be able to do that when they control the monetary system. Now, let's look at the puzzle for China. Now, somebody asked me once, uh, who are you to talk about geopolitics? Well, let me remind you that I didn't study business. I studied political science and economics. I'm very well worth on history. I actually wrote my final thesis for my, for my BA on the creation of the euro and why I argued that it was never going to work because people weren't going to change their attitudes. However, that's here nor there. The important thing is this, is that when you look at it from a geopolitical perspective, Afghanistan is a massive win for China, which they won without putting down one bullet, right? The whole, Afghanistan is so important. The, the British understood this in the 1800s. They called this the great game because they understood that he who controlled the, uh, what's the valley in Afghanistan, the Bakar Valley, the, um, um, the valley that's below the Himalayas that, that connects Okay. The whole geography from, from China, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, that valley, he who controls that area controls the flow of trade between Asia and Europe. That's why Afghanistan the, and Crimea have been such important points to the West. Well, guess what? China just got it all for nothing. They didn't even spend one dollar. And what do they have? Now they can build a pipeline into Iran and deal with their energy problems, right? So I think China has been playing it very well in the background, but you know, I look at puzzles, I look at the chess game, how it's positioning. And to me, it's amazing how it's all positioning itself from a, from a monetary, from a geopolitical, from a political perspective. And I think, what do we have on our side? Just a lot of debt and liabilities that can't be paid back. Yeah, it was interesting. Last week I interviewed Axel Merck and he uh, he had a, a really cool painting in the in the background that had basically China on one side of the fence throwing dollars over the the fence, and the U.S. on the other side throwing gold bars back. And yes, I've seen that one. The interesting point you also make about about the Afghanistan situation that <clears throat> I was reading about is that they also got in a way uh, a signal 
from the US that they're not going to be standing by and defending their previous um, positions, let's say. So that somewhat puts Taiwan into into a precarious position as well, right? Well, it's funny because I keep arguing, is China going to allow Cuba in in the South China Seas? So I think that Taiwan's definitely the final piece of the puzzle, which is actually, as a person that has actually read the the speeches for the five year triumvirate of the of the Chinese government, if you look at the last speech, they said that they want to recreate uh, the Silk Road and the Silk Road or China as it was prior to the British getting involved in Hong Kong, included including Taiwan and Taipei. So they want that area. It's what they consider to be China for, what, 3,000 years? And we're going to stop them because they've controlled it for, what, 100 years, maybe? Mm -hmm. So, no, I think that China's paying it very cool, very well, and it's Sensu at its best. You know, what was the the number one? The the best wars are the ones you don't have to fight, where your your enemy has already lost. And I do think that that is the case. It's funny, this whole... um, um, military deal between the U.S. and and the U.K. and all the noise that is occurring. Well, to me, it's noise. The Chinese uh, are going to become part of the future. And I think it's important to understand what the new setup is and what do we do as investors and as people living in the West, how do we position ourselves? And, And I think that's the important component that I think as investors, we have to start thinking about because we are facing um, uh, a paradigm shift, you know, Ray Dalio talked about it, and it has to do with the currency. At the currency level, China will be the next currency reserve, and they will control the flow of goods because they're going to be paid in whatever currency they decide to set up back by gold. They know that. So as, as you mentioned the, the currency, Jaime, what considerations do you think that people need to think about as, as they go ahead? Do you think they're going to be pushing this this digital yuan backed possibly by gold? Well, I think China already said that they wanted to have a, when they were asked to, it's funny, let's look at the, at the movements within the SDR, the special drawing rights. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very in, in, interesting. There was a, something I posted just about three or four weeks ago, how the IMF had funded the SDR uh, for Russia. But in order to do that, they had to sell some gold or transfer some gold over to Russia, which makes complete sense. The Russians, actually, it's funny because what, they're up to what, 2,200 tons now? So they've been selling energy to Europe, but they're not bringing home euros or dollars, they're bringing home gold, right? And the Chinese had already said that if they're going to participate in any SDR or any currency reserve, it had to have some hard backing. It would be silly to think that China is going to give up its monetary power to the IMF. That I don't think so. I think that the bankers would be smoking some fine Canadian cannabis if they really think that. Uh, China is strategic. They want to control their 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 system in terms of the 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 purchasing power of whatever they dictate, because that'll be the number one measure to control internal inflation, which China knows every government, Mao, Mao came to power and lost his power because of inflation. Throughout history, inflation has been the number one problem for China, and China never forgets. And, and I think one of, the, one of the interesting things here is that, you know, that we, we can look at, at a number of examples. So China stacking gold, Russia stacking gold, something like Palantir um, buying $50 million worth of gold to put on their balance sheet and also accepting gold as payment for any of their services. It seems like these, these powerful entities that don't want to keep taking US dollars, um, that seems like a, a shift that we haven't necessarily seen, let's say, mm-hmm. all the time in, in years past, right? Well, it's interesting because uh, let's look at Palantir and Michael Sayers' company. What is that? MicroStrategy? Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at both of them, they're both seeking alternatives to the cash they're sitting on. They're sitting on a lot of cash. I actually look at gold, silver, and blockchain in, in tandem in that, to me, gold and silver are about the monetary power. Uh, blockchain is a decentralizing technology that's going to change the world in the way we function. Kind of like what the what email did to the post office, mm-hmm. right? Why would I pay fees to a bank to 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 ledger my money, to ship it somewhere, to pay my bills when I can do it electronically through the beauty of blockchain? Mm-hmm. 
So I disassociate the two. I think the 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 the, the difference with Michael Sayer when his decision to buy Bitcoin, he just figured out, well, how am I going to make money? Because he realized that gold doesn't go up. But there's a reason. We know that it's being manipulated. They pay fees for that. And you have to understand if you once you realize that it's being manipulated, it's the why and by whom and for whose benefit. Well, I got to tell you, China has been the number one benefit of the manipulation of gold. They ended up with 20,000 tons of our gold at a very cheap price. Now, Palantir looked at it different. Instead of asking, the, how am I going to make money? They asked the why of both. When you ask the why of both, it's a different story because then you understand that gold after 4,000 years is still money, still the, uh, the real form of money, money that has transcended civilization. So in a way, it's tradition. Uh, that's the one thing that Bernanke said years ago, why do you hold gold? It's because it's tradition. Well, um, you know, understanding enough about the Jewish faith that they understand tradition, they understand that that is ultimate form of money. That's why they, they don't let it go, but they also understand that we can't give it to the plebs. We can't allow the citizens to have it. We have to control it so that we control the purchasing power. To me, that is beauty because it means that the number one rule I learned at Gordon Capital was that you make good money when the reality and the perception are askew. Well, what is the perception today? Oh, the stock market's going to go on forever. Gold is nothing. What is the reality? Well, gold stock market's always correct. And if we look back at that picture we started at the beginning, 300 trillion worth of debt versus 120 trillion worth of, of inflated markets, well, let's say the market corrects by 30%, which I'm being very conservative. Let's put it at 90 trillion. Well, we still have 300 trillion. That doesn't disappear. The markets go up and down priced in the currency. Well, what if the currency that you're pricing those markets all of a sudden disappears like in 1933 because we need to cleanse the system? Well, those markets are, aren't going to be worth much in that currency. And that's what people are missing. So to me, the, 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 the spread between perception are re and, and reality are as, as skewed as they've ever been. And that is a beautiful trade. That's why I keep saying, if you're going to hedge accordingly, gold, silver, and blockchain. The percentages are 20% in blockchain and the rest 50-50 in gold and silver, because I think silver is gonna is gonna be a, you know, it's it's gonna be like Netflix versus Microsoft in the high tech move. Mm -hmm. Right. So Jaime, when when we think about let's say these these currency collapses, how do you think a country like Canada that with our central bank not holding any gold whatsoever, how does that affect our currency in a in a crisis situation versus a country like the U.S. or or China that has a lot of gold on their balance sheet. Well, let's think about the fact that we are an aging population. I would start by just looking at Argentina or Latin America through the '80s and '90s and understand what happened. What happened in Chile? Chile had. Uh, it's it's funny because Chile to me is the number the, the the one country that actually did it right. Pinochet was uh, was a tyrant. Right. It's funny. My father was uh, was um, on the left side of the spectrum and 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 uh, Pinochet was on the right side of the spectrum. Years later, I said to my dad, you know what? I think uh, history is going to remember Pinochet as the most Chilean of all Chileans. And he says to me, what craziness are you talking about now? And I said, well, if you really think about it and you measure Pinochet by what he did for human rights, he gets a 100. He was a badass. But if you measure what he did for the economy, Chile today has twenty five hundred dollars worth of per capita debt. He actually cleansed the debt. And that was a very tough cleansing, right? So what he did for the economy, um, he, he really cleansed it and prepared it for what we're going through today. So I think Chile will be one of those economies that's going to come up much more quicker than the rest of the world, but they've already gone through the pain. Now, why is that important? Because the motto of Chile is by reason or force. So he did by force what could have been done by reason. Right. And the, the key is that look at Canada and how much debt, all the liabilities. We are an aging population. And now we have, you know, just 300 billion, is it? Like it's, it's crazy numbers that, you know, once you get over, you know, if you owe 5 million or you owe 10 million and you're only making 100,000 bucks a year, it doesn't really matter. You're broke. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so the consequences are highly inflationary. It's the same thing that happened to, to through Latin America, to Brazil, to Argentina, the inflation of things. 
because it's not people have to understand that inflation is not that things are going up in price. It's that the currency you're buying it with is the, it's devaluing. Well, the Canadian dollar is going to devalue because we have all these liabilities. We have nothing hard backing it. We have resources on the ground, which they're going to task. I think taxes are, 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 are going to be part of the equation globally. So I'm not hiding away from taxes. Uh, but I think the value of the resources as the Chinese come after them in that new currency is going to escalate and versus the Canadian dollar. So my play is to play the, the, the hedge between the currencies as the, they revalue to the new monetary system, which is exactly what happened in 1933. If you had owned, it's funny. So, so if you had had uh, $7,000 at the beginning of 1930 in the Dow, in gold and in Alaska, June and homestake mining, which were the barrack and the gold crop of the time, $7,000 after what, 30, after about 20 years through the depression, you walked away with 2,400 bucks in the Dow. In gold, you walked away with $35,000 because of the rebalancing of the purchasing power of the pound versus the new dollar. And in Alaska, June and homestake mining, you walked away with 89,000 bucks plus a dividend of 10% because when gold was trading at seven, they were producing at five. When gold moves to 35, they're still producing at five, right? Now they're selling it at 35. All that excess cash flow went into equity value and, and um, dividend payment. So you had a 10 to 15% dividend from those companies. I think the same thing is already replaying, and we're seeing it in the rise of dividends of the sector. It's funny, the sector is doing exactly what it's done for 4,000 years. Investors aren't noticing that. Great free cash flow, even with this declining price because they're producing at, at Nico 650 bucks Canadian, maybe even 900, call it you know 650 is the number that hit, brings in my head. But if you call it 900, you still get a double up to 1,800, 1,750. And that's Canadian versus US dollars. Now, they've been increasing the dividend all along. What's important is that the earnings are growing at a faster pace than inflation which is what these companies have always done throughout history. So history is replaying for 4,000 years, but yet investors are chasing these stocks that continue to go higher and higher because they think they're going to go up forever. Well, tell you what, it's not going to go up forever because the Fed members have fessed up that they've been buying the same securities with that inflated money, and now they're getting out for ethical reasons. <laughs> ethical, my dot, 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 dot. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I think the game is up. I think they know that they have to start buying gold and we're, we're getting to some 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 very critical points within within uh, the world that we're heading into. I mean, as, as you mentioned, you mentioned taxes there. And of course, I think it's today we're, we're facing a, a federal election in Canada. So what do you think um, basically the, the road ahead what do you think about that for for Canada and, and Canadians? Are are we facing you know way higher taxes? What what are the what are the differences between Trudeau getting another another win here? You know what I'm I'm agnostic with regards to the politics because the problem is is that if you if you follow history the way I do, the leaders that are going to clean us out of this mess are not there yet because we are not aware of the mess yet. Mm -hmm. Right. To us, it's all, um, um, you know, uh, it's like that song, Paper Moon. It was always make believe, you know, a moon over a cardboard sea. Mm -hmm. Well, until we realize that it's all make believe, we're not going to start doing anything to clean it. Right. To fix the car until it breaks. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're just running with a motor, which is full of oil. And, and you know, so, yeah, I'm agnostic with regards to the politics. I think my advice as a financial advisor, as a portfolio manager, is to get my clients to prepare for what's coming so that they have the resources to be able to succeed and protect their families um, going forward, which is exactly what my grandfather did in Chile, right? He saw the mess coming. Sadly, he had a stroke and died early, and my, my uncle who took over his company uh, didn't didn't succeed because he didn't see it, but he prepared right, and that was the one lesson that he left behind for me to do in terms of looking forward. There are um, signals that history has left behind that you know if you read a little bit, um, you know the the great writers of the past, Hemingway, right? Hey, how did you go broke? 
uh, gradually and suddenly. That's inflation because it's exponential. Now, let's talk about inflation for a second because people have to understand what, why everybody got so, so um, um, inflation, it's an exponential event. And what that means is that it grows faster over time. So what's important is the, the time frame for it to double. OK, so if you really look at inflation numbers, we hit 0.75, call it 1 percent. I believe it was in April of 2020. Well, we got to 2 percent by May. Uh, sorry, whatever the, the, the time frame was, nine months. It took nine months. So call it May of 2021 to get to 2 percent. But then we went from 2 percent to 4 percent within four months after that. So inflation is accelerating. That's why the whole everybody got all concerned once we got over five, because five percent was the number, the minimum number that we needed to get inflation down in the 80s. But keep in mind that five percent then is not five percent now because we've changed the way they count it. So people don't see it. Right. Food, energy are not components right, of, of inflation. So so what's important is that it's accelerating. It's not decelerating. And what it's signaling is that the fiat currencies are in full decline. Right. Because, again, it's not that things are going up in prices, that money is devaluing. Now, what's more concerning is that PPI is doesn't hide the number the way that CPI does, because that's a producing side of the equation. And that's already over seven. So I think people have to wake up and realize, oh, wait a minute, we have a, a, an S&P 500 with a dividend yield of what, one percent or less or less? Right. I don't even bother to look anymore because I know it's, 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 it's irrational. But then you have inflation at seven percent. So, so you have a, the setup for a massive correction in both bond markets, equity markets, um, and that's really good for gold. Like to me, gold is um, the, the fact that it's being held down in price. I don't think it's going to be for much longer because sooner or later, the bankers are going to get on the other side. They know that they need it and they're holding it. And, and Jaime, you're, you're mentioning basically the, the debt problem. Uh, over and over, right? And you know, we're we're coming into this week with the with the Fed meeting on Wednesday, and uh, I was reading that they have quote worked hard to make the meeting about news and about its bond buying program as uneventful <laughs> as possible. So, is this basically just a signal to the market that there's no no possible way that they're going to be tapering at this time? Tom, I lost faith in the in the Fed in <laughs> 2008. You know, I'm a repo trader. Mm -hmm. I know how the system works and how they they play with the system. So, you know, to me, the Fed is for for those that are still believing and I want to listen to it. You know, it's like the captain of the Titanic telling me to be to be uh, comfortable after we've hit the after we hit the iceberg. But hey, I am not somebody sitting in the third in, 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 in below decks with the cl doors closed so I don't get to the lifeboats. I've been sitting on the lifeboats all along. So, yeah, I'm not even going to pay attention to the Fed. If anything, I'm just going to concentrate on touching base with my clients and, and, and make sure that they're comfortable in the lifeboats, not listening to the music mm -hmm. with, uh, at first deck because it's still playing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so my focus is completely different. Um, and I think most people are losing faith in the system as a whole. You know, I know that the discussions I have, the conversations I have because of everything that's going on around us, there's a lot of concern, but there's a lot of questions. Again, we're redefining our, our world. Uh, um, how to put it? Sorry. Um, the, the, it's funny because I think, re remember years ago, everybody would, would say, oh, the earth is at the center of the, of the universe. Then the earth is flat. Well, the world order got completely appended during the during the during the Renaissance, right? And I think those are beautiful periods, but we got to go through the pain of getting to that level, and that's what's happening. We're fully re redefining everything. I'm hoping that at the end of this, we come out more, uh, you know, more aware of each other, more aware. I was reading a great article on um, the the gal that won the U.S. Open, right? how her father's Romanian, had come here, mother's Chinese, they met here, then they, they went over there. But then again, her opponent, her father is from El Salvador, I believe, or from Honduras, it's her coach, married a Filipino woman. I am from Chile, married a Canadian gal from, from Newfoundland. We have beautiful children. I love the way Canada is this melting pot of the world and how I'm hoping that as a human race, we become aware of each other as we go through, through this change that is happening. Right. Absolutely. So Jaime, as you're, 
you're, you mentioned the the lifeboats that you that you're trying to help you know save save your own portfolio and and your your clients assets let's say um what what piece of those lifeboats do you think is a are are a good buy right now so we've seen gold miners just get pummeled basically this this entire year so how do you how do you try and look at um you know entrance points and exit points Okay. Well, first of all, asset allocation is key. I, asset allocation to me is 80% of, of a portfolio's return over time, right? So when I'm, I'm, I've been taking in a lot of new money, people that are sitting in cash are coming in. And what I'm saying, look, let's stay 50% in cash, but cash is the problem. So you can't really stay in cash, mm-hmm. right? I wouldn't want to be in cash at a bank because anything over 100,000 with the bailed in changes. Now you're a shareholder of the bank. You're no longer lending your money to the bank. I don't want to go any further on that, but people have to understand what that means. So if cash is the problem in Canada, well, I recommend, first of all, let's keep 50% in cash, 50% of that in some, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, credit union paper, because credit union paper is backed 100% by the provincial government. So to me, that has the highest the highest uh, safety. The other 50% in gold and silver as physical money. So then we take the other 50% and I always say, you know, let's buy some, some of those dividend paying stocks that are great inflation hedges, but initially they will take a, they will take a, a price appreciation if we have a market correction, the Enbridges, the pipelines, the utilities, the REITs. But again, there, um, um, it's 50% of the portfolio that's getting invested. And I would put about uh, 30% of those, 30 to 40%, in to generate cash flow while everything else is in cash. And then the producers. The producers to me are the place to be, not explorers. I, I disassociate between producers and explorers. Exploration plays are great because they can offer quite a lot of upside as refining the resource on the ground, but the producers are a gift, right? They're, they're paying a lot of cash flow. Their cash flow is going to get better as things get worse. So, so both gold and silver producers, but then again, we got to look at the risk. So what do you want? Geopolitical risk has to be addressed. Reserves on the ground, cost of production, good quality management, right? So, so, so you got to go through, through the facets in building the portfolio. Clients that are already invested with them, the ones that I've had for a long time, I'm sensing the stress. I'm sensing um, you know, with them, I'm I'm going one by one and cutting back on investments, raising cash levels to 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 somewhere that they're comfortable. Even though we've had some good upside over the last two to three years, they're all also coming back uh, at at always thinking, well, you know, we we hit this high water mark. Now we're down from the high water mark. Nobody thinks, well, we've come from here to here. Well, they're looking at it from the top. So mm-hmm. even though they're down a bit. Uh, they're not realizing. So so I have to deal with the human emotion of it all. And for that, you raise cash, you bring it back to a comfort level, and, and that's all you can do, right? So it's a lot of communication, but it's at the core of it is that asset allocation. How am I structuring the portfolios in order to both, um, on the cash side, the, the, the main thinking is this. Whenever we go through these issues, like look at Russia, look at Argentina, look at Brazil, it's a two to three year period, right? When the Berlin Wall fell apart, it was a two year period, two to three years, two years for it to fall apart economically. In 2008, we saved it because we reinflated the ball and created an even bubble. Today, we're going to have a two year decline. Things will settle down and then things will start to rebuild and start to go up. Well, you have to make it through that two to three year period in a way that you're sound and be able to have assets to reinvest at the bottom of the market. That's why you want the cash, right? Look at 2008, at the beginning of 08, Enbridge was sitting with a 2.5% dividend yield, December of 08, when everybody was selling. Uh, and it's funny because in 08, people were getting out of the market in December when it was already too late. Well, we had a 9.5% dividend yield. If you didn't have cash, you couldn't take advantage of that opportunity. So again, it's about it's about preparing ahead of the storm, lowering your sales, you know. And um, it's funny, I, 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 I was lucky enough to sail through a hurricane once in my 20s. We were delivering a boat from Norfolk to, to Bahamas. Hurricane Bob that came up the coast. And the scariest part of a storm is after, the, after we go through the eye, right? And that's what's coming now. I think the eye of the storm was the period between 08 and now. And I think here comes the the 
the, 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 the hardest part of the storm. And it's about preparing your ship to get through it, to be able to benefit from it on the other side. Excellent, Jaime. Um, do you have anything else th that you'd like to like to mention before we wrap up here? Uh, I say patience and 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 be sure to think outside of the box and prepare um, prepare for what comes next. And and um, you know, best of luck to everybody. Um, uh, but do under do, do the way I see it. I think we're going through a massive power shift, a paradigm shift, and I feel ready for what's coming. Um, and it's about uh, you know, relaying and communicating with people. Um, love your family. You know, I think love is the the number one glue for for everything. And be honest with um, with with um, with the people around you. And yeah, so it's it's hard. It's hard to say something knowing that you know we are heading for for not better times yet, but we have to get through it. You know, Leonard Cohen. It's through the cracks that the light comes in. Some some sound advice there, Jaime. Um, of course, you're you're available on Twitter at IJ Carrasco and Jaime Carrasco on LinkedIn. You you post a lot of good stuff, good articles. Um, Jaime, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Always appreciate coming on, Tom. Thank you for having me. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.